What's up, Prime Fam? What's going on, guys? Uh, in the gym, I'm finishing up my last set of bench press here. I'm dying. I got a tempo bench after I did squats and deads. SPD day. I wanted to give you guys some advice that I wish someone had actually preached to me a long time ago when I was in my earlier years of powerlifting back in like 2011 to the 2013 range. Um, we got five tips here. I'm gonna shoot you guys each of these tips. We're gonna go in depth on each one. Now, a lot of you are gonna hear this and think I'm like nitpicking little details that might give you a tiny edge. That's not the case here. These things, if you implement all these, will actually make a dramatic effect on your outcome when you get to the platform on meet day. This is specifically aimed at for the end of a training cycle, the last four to eight weeks leading into a meet. These tips are gonna be surrounding that. And the first one's gonna be to bring in a lot of high frequency of competition specificity. So people who follow my channel know I usually use uh, higher frequency DUP type templates. So when I program for clients, they're usually squatting anywhere from three to four times a week, benching around the same time. Deadlifts are usually a little bit lower frequency, but because of this higher frequency, I often utilize a lot of variation in the off season. People saw my last video on variation when we were about 12 or 16 weeks out or so, and I was doing a lot of close grip Larsen press and things of that nature. But when we get close to meet day, um, sometimes anywhere from four to eight, maybe even more weeks out, I like to bring in a lot of higher frequency on the competition lifts because it allows for you to get technically proficient on the lifts. There's a big misunderstanding with variation People think uh, variance in the competition lifts can fix technical errors in the movements themselves. This may be true for a couple lifts here and there, but for the most part, variation is to bring up muscular deficiencies. If you have a weak back, we're gonna attack your upper back like crazy, okay? But that's very different than you having a weak upper back because you're not technically proficient in the squat or deadlift when you're trying to get your upper back tight. This can only be solved by getting technically proficient on the lift itself. And I would say, at minimum four weeks out everyone should be doing pretty high frequency on the main lifts with a little catch here or there like today I have a competition style bench press but with a tempo so instead of doing something like a close grip Larson press I'm doing a competition lift but because I am dealing with some injuries some people can't handle higher frequencies on the main lifts what I might do is implement something like a tempo lift like I'm doing for me or Kristen or things that are closer variations this isn't a hard set rule but what I will say is the more specific you can be while staying injury free the more it's gonna help you on meet day. Today I was practicing things on my low bar squat, like setting my back. I am using a more narrow grip on my squat position than I have in a very long time because I gained a lot of weight. I got a little too chubby. And so I widened my squat grip for a while, but I decided to bring it back in because I always felt a little bit better there. And to get used to the positioning again, I'm actually utilizing a higher frequency approach on my competition lift. I'm squatting low bar three times a week now in my comp lift style with the belt, sleeves, everything. And you can see I'm really trying to focus on getting getting that upper back tight without overextending my ribs. So these are little nuances you can work on, whether it's bench grip um, problems with your elbows flaring or whether it's tightness in your back with the, the sumo deadlift or bracing up top. That's something Kristen was dealing with today in her sumo deadlift. We're really trying to get her so as long and her brace down. It, it doesn't matter what the problem is, you're gonna utilize this higher frequency of specificity to really help you out. A lot of people think they know this, but they don't implement it in their training. So that's number one for the tip. Okay. Tip Tip number two, sorry guys, I'm dying. I'm doing my sets in between this and it's tempo bench, which is by far the worst lift to do a tempo on in my opinion. Tip number two, practice competition commands. You'll see uh, with this video I'm gonna splice in with Kristen, we're already practicing her press commands. Now, even though she always trains with a pause on the chest, whether she's doing eight reps or one rep on the bench press, it is very different to hear an audible command in the bench press and have to wait for it than it is to just press under your own leisure after doing your own style of pause. You may get a long pause depending on bar movement and how strict the judges are being. You may get a quick pause, but it's very important that you prepare your mind for this. Same thing on the squat, the deadlift, they all have commands. Now, a lot of people know this and they say, oh, we're gonna practice commands. They do it one week out and then they go blow their load on the platform and only get like seven for nine because they miss a bench command or they miss a squat command, something like that. This should be so ingrained in you. By the time you reach the platform, it's just second nature for you to hold the squat after you get it up. Second nature for you to wait for the bench command. Second nature for you to hold your lockout on the deadlift. You want it ingrained where you don't have to think about 
about it, it just happens. Four weeks out at minimum, maybe even more, you should be practicing every heavy day on squat, bench, and deadlift, doing your commands, and getting an audible command, especially on bench press, is huge, from someone else doing it, and tell them to look for the bar having zero movement on your chest, because that's what the referee is gonna be looking for. Once that bar comes to a true stop with zero motion, that's when they're gonna give you the command. You won't get it if that bar's shifting around on your chest. So if you practice this in training, not only will it help you with practicing staying tight on the chest, it'll also get you used to hearing that audible command so that's tip number two now this next one tip number three again is something that people are going to think they do but they don't do it to enough of a uh, scrutinized detail so what I want you to do is always use utilize competition specific equipment when you can I would highly recommend at least close to your training find a powerlifting gym even if you have to commute a little bit for it Chris and I we come to iron warehouse out here in Newark California it's about a 35 minute drive from our house in traffic sometimes 45 minutes but for us it's worth it because of the competition specific equipment Equipment. Now, when I was younger, I was very convinced that I could train just as well in a 24-hour fitness with their gym bars and plates and I could on competition equipment. You won't know until you regularly train on this equipment. Then you notice the vast difference in stability specifically. Now, going a little bit further in detail though, what I want you to do is actually email the meet directors if you have to or look at the detailed notes on the entry form of your meet and see what kind of competition equipment they're using. Just because you're going USAPL does not mean they're gonna use Ohio Power Bars. They use Titex bars at USAPL Raw Nationals this year. They've used um, uh, Ohio Power Bars. They use Lyco bars in Texas at all USAPL meets. Almost they use Texas Strength bars, which most USAPL meets don't. You need to know what kind of equipment you're going to be training on. The difference in bars is huge. A Texas Power Bar has a much more fat spacer, which causes more instability and whip in the bar compared to a kilogram version of a uh, Ohio Power Bar that Rogue produces. They also have more lateral movement to that spacer and there's just a lot more spin to the bar itself. And this is gonna feel very different. If you're prepping for USBA meet and you're using your Ohio Power Bar in your um, training, you're gonna feel pretty unstable when you get to squats and um, bench press if you're using a Texas uh, Power Bar. Also, for the bigger guys, if you're in USPA, you may be using a squat bar in the 198 and up class, but it depends on the meet. If it's a one-day meet, sometimes they use the Texas Power Bar for everyone. Sometimes around flight B or C, they switch to the guys to a, um, a squat bar. The squat bar feels very different than a Texas Power Bar. So know what kind of equipment you're gonna be using on um, in the, the meet and prepare for that using it in the gym. Uh, also, the kind of plates you use vastly affects the whip, the spin of the bar, how it feels if you have a deadlift bar loaded up with with bumper plates or pound plates I've had videos on this in the past you're gonna get way more whip on your deadlift way more whip on your squat than if you use the narrow competition style plate so I highly recommend scrutinizing every little detail in your training and try to mimic everything that you can so you get prepared for the platform and what it's gonna be like lifting on the day that you're actually competing on. Tip number four, I've lightly mentioned this on the channel quite a bit, uh, practicing acute fatigue. So what I mean by that is I want you guys to actually align the day of your heaviest training on squats and deads or if you have an SBD day, squat bench and deadlift day, uh, on the day of the meet you're gonna be competing at. This is hugely important, especially for national level meets where you want, really wanna perform well. Some of you may be going on like Thursdays, really random days if you're uh, in the lower weight classes and doing like a national level meet. If it's like a local meet, usually they're held on Saturdays and Sundays and depending on your weight class, you'll be split up there. Know what day you're competing on and start uh, aligning your heaviest training day with the day you'll be competing on so you can practice acute fatigue fluctuations, especially for people utilizing higher frequency DUP style programming. What this will do is really allow you to manipulate the variables on your secondary and tertiary squat and bench and deadlift days so you can feel really fresh on the day that it's most important for you to perform. And not only this, it helps you learn your body and how to peak yourself when it actually comes time for the real big peak where we drop chronic fatigue, okay? Now, to take this even a step further that I do with some of my clients, not all of them, is I'll have them start training on that day if they if their schedule permits it. The time of day that they'll be uh, competing on the platform, especially for national level meets. If you're someone who's going at 6 p.m. at nighttime, but you're used to training in the day, you're gonna wanna be practicing your heavier lifts at nighttime, otherwise you may feel uh, really gassed and kind of not ready to train by the time you get out there on the platform. Same thing for local meets are often held very early in the morning if you're used to training at night. This can really start to screw you up. I also start manipulating things like caffeine and stuff. Usually we like to load up on caffeine the day of a meet. What I actually do is try to reduce my caffeine intake on my secondary, tertiary, the, the kind of easier volume-based days later on in the week, but I save uh, kind of higher doses of caffeine, similar to how a one is on competition day 
to just feel very uh, used to what I'm gonna be doing on the meet day. Now again, a lot of people I think are gonna think these are nitpicky details. I can't express how far this will go to really help you feel ready for your meet day. If you add up the competition equipment, the, um, the, the time of day you're training, all these different tips I'm giving you, each one's gonna give you a little edge to feel extremely fresh and ready on the platform. And that's gonna be pounds on the bar that you're getting. And I can't express enough how important it is to nitpick these details and really set yourself up for the best possible meet day you can have. Now tip number five is gonna be something that I want to go a little bit deeper in on future videos, especially surrounding programming. Uh, this is something I get questioned about a lot because people have seen I've utilized this in my training, but that's heavy singles in training. So tip number five is gonna be make sure you have heavy singles in your training before the meet. A lot of people I still see utilizing kind of what I would call older school styles of periodization and programming where uh, they may just go very linear through volume blocks all the way from doing you know high reps on squats of like you know tens or fifteens all the way down to like twos and ones a couple weeks before the meet. I think this is a big mistake. Now again this kind of escapes this depth uh, the depth of this video. I need to go more in detail on to how to do this but especially for female trainees if you only have a couple heavier singles in training before your meets that heavy weight on your back is going to feel very foreign. This is something I've seen happen with a lot of trainees. They don't get used to these loads on their back quickly enough. When your maxes especially are very low like say you're new to powerlifting and your squat max is somewhere in the 200s as a female or three or four hundreds as a male the difference on in your you know like how 70 percent feels to you to compared to how like 90 percent plus feels to you is very dramatic someone who's a little bit stronger they can get accustomed to staying away from the heavier singles a little bit more in training than i think someone who's a little bit newer this isn't to say you can't hit prs you know doing it a different way but i do think it's vitally important to do this now i don't mean singles going rp 10 or 9 or 8 even very often but even just splashing in singles of RP6 or 7 into your programming leading into a meet and periodizing it with a wave load of some kind and having some form of uh, programming behind it that makes sense can really set you up for success and again this comes back to competition specificity we're not going to do a double on the platform we're not going to do set 7 we're going to do one single this lets you practice the commands perfectly this lets you feel what it feels like to have a heavy load on you and to have to hear those commands while that heavy load is on you and if you train in like a more powerlifting style gym usually there's a lot of people kind of watching you I think this is vitally important for you to feel and practice before you actually get to the meet now how to program this is a little differently I hope most of you guys actually have coaches uh, if you are going into a meet I can't express how important it is to actually have a coach to prepare you a lot of people think they need to wait to get a coach you should be getting a coach as soon as possible but if you don't have one I would uh, encourage you to practice your programming and learn yourself a little bit and learn how to program and implement this into your training before meet day because it can go quite a bit further for you to get better results. Those are the five tips, guys, uh, for the video. If you have any questions, leave them down below. Give the video a thumbs up and share it with anyone, especially the newer powerlifters getting ready for their meet. I think this stuff can really help some people out. And even the veterans, I know a lot of you guys kind of know this, but you may not be implementing it as much as you think into your training. So, uh, guys, let me know what you liked about the video, what you didn't like, and until next time, we'll see you guys later.